Would you admit that you have a sin nature that just drives you to sin? Most people would say yes, but you know, if you're a Christian, that's not true. You no longer have a sin nature. You aren't schizophrenic. Man, this is good news. Stay tuned for the Gospel Truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that emphasizes God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm just about to the end of my fourth week of teaching on the true nature of God. Tomorrow's going to be my last day to teach on this <coughs> on television. And so I want to encourage you to please get the materials. There's no way I can go back and summarize four weeks worth of teaching on this, but that's what those tapes and CDs will do. So please take advantage of it. Remember, tomorrow's going to be my last day to offer that here over the television. I've been talking about the grace of God. I've been talking about what God's nature really is, that His nature is love, that He never wanted to impute man's sins unto them. But instead, he wanted to put all of our sins upon Jesus. But before Jesus could come, there had to be a temporary restraint upon sin until the Savior could come. That's what it says in Galatians chapter 3. And so the law was given. But it was given 2,000 years after the fall of man, which indicates that that wasn't God's original purpose and intent. The Lord gave a covenant of grace and faith to Abraham... In Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, 430 years before the law was introduced, so the covenant of grace was already introduced. The law was just a temporary thing until Jesus should come. And once Jesus came, then God has once again not been imputing man's trespasses unto them. And I've used a lot of scriptures on that. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 19 is one of the main ones. What I want to do on today and tomorrow's broadcast is bring some balance to this. And I hate to even use that term because that implies that I've been out of balance in what I've said. Um, I'm not out of balance, but I just want to present the other side to it. Or, or another way of saying this is some people could take what I'm saying and say, well, man, you're saying that we aren't under the law, that God isn't imputing our sins unto us, so I can go live in sin. No, that's not what I'm saying. And I want to answer that question about why live holy then if God isn't imputing our sins unto us and if he's given us everything by grace. Here in the book of uh, Romans, I've been using a lot of passages out of Romans to teach this whole subject. And in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, Paul said this. He says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, if you are familiar with the book of Romans, he'd been teaching on grace. Matter of fact, let me turn back and just read the previous verse. It says, well, the previous two verses, Romans chapter 5, verse 20 and 21. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Again, these are some radical, radical scriptures that where sin abounds, grace abounds greater. And so this would lead some people to this statement that Paul makes here in Romans chapter 6 verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? The answer to that is in verse 2. He says, God forbid. And in the Greek language, this is as close to profanity as you can get without profanity. It is an absolute denial. Absolutely not. Totally no. This isn't what he's saying. But let me bring this point out. If you are listening to someone preach the quote-unquote gospel and it doesn't ever make you think, can I just live in sin because God loves me in spite of my sin? If you never have that thought come to you, then you haven't heard the same gospel that the Apostle Paul was preaching. Man, that's one powerful passage right there. That's amazing. And you know what? There are millions of people watching me all around the world, anywhere in the world that English is spoken, in a lot of places that it isn't spoken. You can see this program. And there's people all around the world that you've been going to church for years and you've never had that thought come to you through somebody's preaching. Are they just saying that I can live in sin? 
No, that's not what I'm saying. No, that's not what the Apostle Paul was saying. But you know what? If you really understand the grace of God, that God is not imputing your sin unto you, that He's not holding sins against you, that He's not demanding your holiness in order to love you or to move in your life. If you really understand that, that is a logical question. And there are four different times that the Apostle Paul had to deal with that and answer this. He did it twice right here in Romans chapter 6. So he says, shall we just live in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. No, that's not what we're saying. And then he gives us two reasons here in Romans chapter 6 why you live holy. Now this is very important that you understand this. And in a nutshell, I'll just say this and then we'll go through and look at them more in detail. But the reason you live holy is not in order to please God. It is not to earn God's favor. God is pleased with you through what Jesus did for you and the only thing that you have to offer to that is faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. Faith is what makes you pleasing to God, not your performance, not your action, not your adherence to some code. So your performance doesn't affect God's attitude towards you, but your performance can affect your attitude towards God. And so that's what this is dealing with. So he says, all right, why should we live holy? He gives two reasons. First of all, here in Romans chapter 6, verse 2, he says, How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And this is a subject that I really should spend a couple of weeks just teaching on this one thing because, again, this is totally misunderstood, I believe, by my opinion, in the body of Christ today. Most people believe that you have a sin nature and then you have a born-again nature. And so you are, in a sense, schizophrenic. You're two different people. You're this child of the devil on one hand and you're a child of God on the other hand. I don't believe that that's what the Scripture teaches. Now, it's uh, <clears throat> sad, in my opinion, that the NIV has translated some of these things to where it says sin nature and old man and, and different things, and it's not uh, accurate. Uh, and it leaves an impression that some people have drawn doctrines from. But I don't believe that when you get born again that you have the sin nature and a born again nature both on the inside of you. And I'm going to show you that out of these scriptures. So first of all, he says, why should we live holy? Well, first of all, he says, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein. What does it mean, dead from sin? Well, a lot of people struggle with this. And they come up with all kinds of different doctrines. But the word dead to sin just literally is talking about it's incapable of sin. Now, some people immediately reject that and say, hey, that's not true because Christians sin. And by observation, we can tell that Christians still struggle. Christians still lose their tempers. Christians still get into the flesh. Christians still lust and commit adultery and don't tithe and don't go to church and on and on and on you could go. And so they say that can't be what it's talking about. Well, over in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 9, let me read this passage to you. It's saying basically the same thing and this is a truth that is replete, repeated a number of different times in Scripture. But in 1 John chapter 3, in verse 9, it says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Boy, that's one radical passage of Scripture. And people say, what does that mean? That can't be true, because I know I'm born of God. I know I have a relationship with God, and yet I sin. As a matter of fact, if you were to take this in its context, right here in this same book, 1 John chapter uh, 1, and in verse 8, it says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. In verse 10, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Then in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So here's three scriptures in this same book that talks about Christians sinning. And yet, he says over here in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. 
And some people look at this and say, man, I just can't understand this, and they shelve the Bible saying it's too hard to understand. But the key to understanding this is, I, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The only part of you that is in Christ is your born-again spirit. Your spirit gets changed. You don't have a changed body. You are going to have a changed body someday when Jesus comes back and you get your glorified body. You also have a promise according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that someday you will know all things even as also you are known. That's talking about your mental part of you or what the Bible calls your soul. But your spirit is right now changed. Your spirit isn't going to be changed when you get to heaven. You are born again right now. You have the nature of God in you. This is what it's talking about in Romans chapter 6 when it says, How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? It's talking about the spirit part of you. And the spirit part of you is incapable of sin. If you were to walk in the spirit... If you were to be in relationship with God, you can only access that relationship with God through your spirit, not through your flesh. See, again, the law was given for your flesh, for your outer physical man to deal with your actions. The law is always external. But the New Testament grace doesn't deal with just the outside of the cup and the platter, as Jesus put it, but it cleanses you from the inside out. God now has created you a brand new person, and you're a new person in Christ Jesus, and you can not sin in your spirit. You are a new person that has no sin in you. So I've been talking about how that it's your spirit that got born again and in that spirit it is dead to sin. Your nature, the core of your being is a godly person if you have been born again. If Jesus is your Savior and if you were truly changed, that change isn't going to just take place in heaven. It's going to be completed in heaven because you're going to have a glorified body and a glorified soul. But right now in your spirit, you're as saved as you're ever going to get. And this is what it's referring to in Romans chapter 6 when it says, How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? In other words, his argument here is, why do we live holy then if God isn't holding our sin against us? Why do you live holy? Well, the first reason is, it's your nature to live holy. Now, some of you might take issue with that because you say, well, boy, it doesn't seem like it's my nature. You know, I've talked to a lot of people, a lot of Christian men who still have lust in their heart and they just can't understand why they're struggling with lust. There's people who still lie. There's people who still tend to cheat. There are people who still desire ungodly things and they, so they, they have just embraced this saying, well, after all, that's my nature. I'm an old sinner saved by grace. But that's not accurate. According to these verses, it is not your nature. In verse 3 it says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Man, those are powerful statements. And I haven't got time to explain this in its totality, but this isn't talking about water baptism. This is talking about when you get born again, you are baptized into the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I believe in verse 13, talks about that. In verse 5 it says, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Verse 6, knowing this. Now this is an important point right here. We have been planted together in the likeness of his death. That was revealed in verses 3 and 4. But it says we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection if we know this. What is it that you have to know? Now the, the death, the being baptized into the death, when you get a new born again spirit, your spirit is dead unto sin, incapable of sin. It cannot sin, as it says over in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. 
So that part is already accomplished. But whether you start living that out and walk free from sin, walk a resurrected life where you have the power of God is dependent upon you knowing something. It says in verse 6, you have to know this, that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. You have to know that your old man is crucified. Most Christians today are taught that their old man or old sin nature is still alive and functioning and is what is driving you towards sin. And so they don't know this, therefore they don't have the resurrection life of God flowing in them. And some of you might be saying, but what about my tendency to sin? If you're saying that I don't have a sin nature anymore, what is it driving me to sin? It's an unrenewed mind. It's, your mind is similar to a computer. You can program a computer, and then it'll just continue to function the way it was programmed, and it can't operate any differently unless you put new programming into it. Your old sin nature when you were separated from God, when you were dead to God, separate from God, your lost nature, your sin nature taught you how to be selfish, how to operate in lust, how to think only about yourself, how to hate God, how to hate people, how to lie, cheat, steal, do all this stuff. And that's what you've been programmed with. Now you're born again, you got a new nature. It's like get, you got now all of this new hardware. You've got new capabilities. You can do things that you never could have done before. But if you've still got the same old programming, did you know you're going to get the same results that you had before? If you got new hardware on a computer, but if you didn't get new software to go along with it, you would still be limited by that software. You wouldn't be able to take advantage of all of the improvements. We have now been born again. You don't have that old dead sin nature in you compelling you to sin anymore. But we haven't been reprogrammed. And so we still are lusting and struggling and being defeated, not because we have a nature that is driving us to it, but because you haven't renewed your mind to who you are in Christ. If you were to reprogram yourself, you could experience new results. And this is what Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's talking about the reprogramming of your mind. If you would renew your mind, there is nothing any longer that compels you to act like the devil. The only reason we still act like the devil is because we haven't renewed our mind and changed our thinking. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinks in his heart, that's the way that he is. You are going to act the way you think. If you think, I'm an old sinner, saved by grace, but at my core, I am still an unworthy sinner. Well, then you might resist sin to a point, but when it just keeps knocking and keeps persisting and the devil puts pressure on you, you know what you're going to give in because after all, you are an old sinner. That's who you think you are. But if you were to say, no, I was an old sinner, but I've been saved by grace and now I'm the righteousness of God. And if you could see that this is who I am, I'm clean, I'm pure, I'm not going to act like this anymore, it would change you. You know, I heard Kenneth Hagin one time give his testimony that he got born again, very miraculous circumstances. But the very next day, he had his friends come to him and want him to go pick a lock. He said that if he ever had a natural talent, it was an ability to pick locks. And so every time his friends wanted to steal something and break in, they would have him pick the locks. So they came and got him, asked him to pick a lock so they could break in and steal something the way that they'd done many times before. And he said, I can't do it. And they said, why not? And he said, I'm a new creature. I've been born again. And Kenneth Hagin instantly see, changed his identity and says, I'm not like that anymore. Well, the way most people teach it today, they'd say, oh yeah, you're still an old sinner. You're still a thief. You still pick locks but now you shouldn't do it. Well, then he might have resisted it for a period of time, but after a while he would have said, after all, this is who I am. This is what my natural talent is, and he would have succumbed to it. This is saying that you have to know that your old man is dead. You know, I've used this example many times, but this shirt right here has got buttons on it. I button this shirt. I know I buttoned this shirt because nobody else dressed me, so I know I had to button this shirt. But you know what? It, I don't even remember doing it. It's just like it's automatic. It's like my nature. It's like it just somehow or another, it's just something that I do. 
But you know what? I can remember that it, was, it didn't come to me natural. When I was a little kid, I had trouble buttoning my shirt. Matter of fact, I put on a shirt last night uh, and I actually buttoned it wrong. <laughs> I looked in the mirror and the thing was buttoned wrong. You know what? I still struggle with that every once in a while. I had trouble with that when I was a kid. So the point that I'm making is I know it's not my nature to just button my shirt because I had to force myself to learn how to, you know, coordinate it so that I'd wind up with the right button in the right hole, etc. But now I've done it so often it just comes naturally. It's like my nature. Well, that's the way that sin is. You think that it's your sin nature compelling you to live in sin, but the truth is it's just that you have repeated it so often. It has become like a second nature to you, but it is no longer a sin nature driving you to commit sin. It's what the scripture calls here in verse 6, the body of sin has to be destroyed. Sin is gone itself. The sin nature is gone. But just like if a person dies, they leave behind a body that has to be decayed and buried and put out of the way. Well, in the same way, your sin nature is gone, but it left behind a body. Wrong thinking wrong attitudes, wrong emotions, and they have to be renewed and be changed. Man, to me, this is a liberating truth. The reason you live holy is because, first of all, it's your nature to live holy. That's what it says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 3. It says, every man, not some men, not most men, not just males, but not females. This is talking about mankind. Every person that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. If you've been truly born again and have the hope of the resurrection on the inside of you, then you purify yourself even as he is pure. That is your nature. That is your goal. Now, you may be doing a bad job of it because, as I've already used scriptures, the law actually makes sin come alive. The law will empower sin. It'll make you lust worse. It'll condemn you. It'll kill you. If you are living under legalistic teaching, you may be failing God big time. But if you're truly born again, you desire to live for God. And the very fact that you desire to do it means that now things that you used to do that you never even felt any conviction about. You enjoyed sinning and you didn't care about it. Now if you go back and do those sins, it bothers you. That is an indication that you've been changed. Your nature is changed. Now you are, are convicted over things that you were never convicted over before. I'm not saying that you fulfilled this desire completely, but if you're truly born again... You have a desire to purify yourself even as he is pure. You no longer have a sin nature that is compelling you to live in sin. The only reason you're living in sin and failing is because of an unrenewed mind. You don't know the truth. Jesus said you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. John 17, 17, thy word is truth. That's the truth that's going to set you free. These truths that I'm talking about, if you can understand that you are no longer a sinner by nature compelled to live in sin, then you know what? You would experience this resurrection life. You have already died unto sin. You don't have a sin nature. You have a new born-again nature. You aren't two people. You aren't schizophrenic if you've been born again. You are one brand-new person, but you have to know that before you begin to start seeing the benefit of it in your life. And those are powerful truths.